Well, good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson tonight. America's political culture is coming apart. The rhetoric is rapidly getting harsher, in case you haven't noticed. It's getting more venomous, and most ominously, it is becoming more racialized. Riots over race and politics were virtually unheard of 10 years ago in this country. Sadly, now they are common. We're living in a scary time, and people know it. A new Fox poll found that 81% of voters think the bonds that hold this country together are weakening. Just a decade ago, people joked about letting states secede from the union or splitting the country into two along political lines. None of that sounds very funny anymore or even far-fetched at this point. So at a volatile moment like this, the last thing this country needs is more demagoguery, especially racial demagoguery, which always leaves the deepest and wounds. On the other hand, whipping people into a frenzy of fear and rage is a guaranteed ratings bonanza and CNN can never resist that. Watch how that network takes the controversy over the national anthem at football games and turns it into a terrifying story about race hatred. If anyone actually believes this is about the flag, then you know the Parks protest was about a bus. Think about that. When he says he was really telling the owners, like, like the owners or the, the plantation owners and the guys playing the league, you know, they're on the plantation and you can't say anything. And so the thing has really escalated. It does sound a little bit, and obviously you can come at me, uh, like he's saying, control your dog. Control your dog to the owners. And now he says they're fearful of the players. So mm -hmm. he is setting up the ugliest kind of tension that you can. And I know when you say control your dog, it's got, it's got a lot of racial overtones to it. So does this situation. Yeah. I don't know how you can look at it and not see how it's racial. Dogs? Who said any dogs? Nobody did, but it doesn't matter. The image is horrifying, and that's the point. You can't turn away from that. Now, do you hate and fear your neighbor a little more by the end of that segment? Of course you do. Imagine millions of people watching that kind of thing all day long. What would happen to the country? We're finding out now. Monique Presley is an attorney. She's a Democratic political commentator, and she joins us tonight. Thanks a lot, Monique, for coming on. Thanks for having me. So I guess what bothers me is, you know, I, I think it's important to have honest conversations about race, but I think you should be responsible because it has the capacity to really scare people and really hurt people and hurt the country. And so when you see a journalist on another network basically make up a quote and say, he's saying control your dogs, which nobody has ever said, and then comment upon this imaginary quote and go off on this, well, it's a racial thing. If I'm watching that with half, you know, asleep, I'm terrified by the end. They shouldn't do that to people. And perhaps you would be terrified at the end, but I'm really not interested in how Chris Cuomo's analogy may terrify people. The issue is why there are protests in the first place and the people who are living terrified every day walking down the street. So if you look at how we got here, we got here because African American men are disproportionately stopped disproportionately searched, disproportionately arrested, and disproportionately killed per capita in this country. That is true. And one brave man decided to first sit and then take a knee. Okay. The escalation didn't come into what I guess you're now calling terror. I'm not really hearing about, frankly, Tucker, a lot of Wait, people being afraid really because quick. of quick I mean, let me Chris just say, Let me just acknowledge that I think a lot of what you say is valid, reasonable, something that we can talk about in debate. But what I really object to and what I think is hurting the country is the demagoguery in the way that it's discussed and described on other channels, particularly on CNN. So for example, what you just said that African-American men are more likely to be stopped and shot, that is absolutely true. But it's a nuanced question, actually. Black men are more likely to be shot by African-American cops than by white cops. I'm not sure that proves anything, but it certainly detracts from the storyline CNN is pushing. And so when you're going to tell a story, you have to tell the whole else what you're doing is you're pushing a false story designed to scare the crap out of people. And that's what they're doing. Right. But even in what you just said, that was incorrect because where, incorrect. where the numbers are concerned, 
when you're talking about more likely, you're talking about statistics into the future. But when you look at the numbers of the race of police officers who have actually killed African American males, there have been more white officers to do it I'm saying, than as black of ones. Right now, so and look, it's I'm not saying, a statistical right now, issue. Actually. What I said is true, and I'm not, look, I'm not drawing a massive conclusion from it other than this stuff is super complicated, okay? Right. So a lot of these cities in which this is taking place are run by African Americans, the majority African American police departments. It doesn't mean there's not racism. I'm not saying there isn't. I'm just saying add the context and don't start using dog analogies, which immediately evoke pictures of, of Alabama 1955 and Bull Connor and all the rest, which are not designed to inform people or elucidate, they're designed to terrify and horrify people, and that's bad for the country. I'm not sure who they're designed to terrify and horrify, though. I keep hearing you say that, and I heard in the intro where you kept saying it's scary, it's terrifying, it's scary. horrifying. But the African Americans were already terrified. They're terrified of law enforcement. They're terrified that the very flag that we revere and adhere to, the very flag that symbolizes the best of freedom in this country, is the same symbol that's now being being used to represent race superiority, the same symbol that's now being used okay, that to represent your things opinion, that are not which I freedom. think I really hope is not a majority opinion in any community because I think it's a crackpot on, with respect theory. But let me give you a specific example of why this coverage has been irresponsible. Spike Lee was up there, you saw on CNN. Right, now, he's not a CNN commentator. He's, he's an not. individual. No, but he's also a, well, he's also owner, a conspiracy a man, nut. No, he's a conspiracy right. nut. Nut. Well, and who, that would that who, would be an opinion, well, no, especially the nut part. Well, I'll give you an example because right. I was there. Mm -hmm. 2006, Spike Lee said to me on television that the levees in New Orleans during Katrina were blown up in order to hurt black people. Now, I don't think he was there during Katrina. I was. As a factual matter, that didn't happen. That's crazier than anything. I don't know Alex Jones has ever said. So you let that guy on your Isn't air. It crazier than anything President Trump has I, ever said? I don't, look, my only point is this country if you likes have, conspiracy nuts okay, right now. But, maybe he'll be our next but president. But maybe that's the problem. So if mm -hmm. you have a guy like that on who said something racially inflammatory and untrue, you should push back a little bit when he theorizes about how this is about the plantation mentality on the basis of no evidence. If you're a journalist, you've got to say, whoa, theorize. can you prove that? He used an analogy and using an analogy that actually came to the minds of many people in African-American communities and in Caucasian communities and in Latino or brown communities. Right. When our president, the president of this country, referred to African-American citizens, tax-paying citizens who are employed, making good money in this country in the NFL as professional athletes. When he referred to them in the manner he did as sons of bitches and said that the owners ought to get those sons of bitches out of there, just drag them out okay. of there. That what? language makes it seem so like these shit. owners have a proprietary interest in the bodies of these African American you know athletes, what? I don't know what such school that you went they to can be. Don't give I me went that to Howard nonsense. University Look, School of Law You're before that. that I went Let to St. Just, Mary's like, University. These are proud of it, okay. right? Look, he's he's these saying are that they stop. should be dragged Look. out of there for a peaceful oh, protest. Me. The next time they get down down on their knees in their peaceful, right. lawful okay. protest. Those SOBs ought to be dragged out of That's there. That's his opinion. Really, as the and president some of the United of these guys, States, hold on. About I another can citizen. I, can, can, I, can I slow you down? Can I slow you down in your speech for one second? You don't like what the president said. Well, but I, I was nobody there. Nobody likes but what I he was said. There. You don't like what he said, do you? I absolutely agree that, that it's SOBs? divisive and offensive to attack the flag. If you've got okay. a problem with the Did police, you think that his language it. was divisive and offensive? I think that there is nothing about what he said that was explicitly racial, and I think it is immoral for you and others to pretend that you know what he was thinking when you I don't. I asked if you liked it or if it was it's offensive. Okay. It was not it's offensive irrelevant. to me okay. it, well, to have I him can understand. say you, weren't the SOB you in question. shouldn't. Okay, but look, he should call them SOBs. Maybe he should have done that. But the point he remains, the point remains, it's not a racial attack. There are white okay. players down on one knee as well. As mm -hmm. you know, you're ignoring that because it doesn't bolster the divisive argument you're seeking to make. The, the issue that they're protesting and the majority of the ones 
fans who are doing it in the NFL you in don't general. Know that. They have well, issued no listen, statement. You know nothing about that because they have issued told no us statement about nothing, what? About what it's about. Okay. The majority so, of players have issued no statement. Don't pretend so you know. The players because you don't. don't. I wasn't pretending. Yes, what I was were. saying is that the National Players Association issued a statement about right. it, saying what they were protesting. So they represent all of the players, and then specific players such as Colin Kaepernick, who right. stood Got out it. first, was Look, protesting Look, you racial can disagree injustice with in how this country. People treat the flag without being a racist. Well, and you're not and allowing room for that. Right? No one it's is constitutional contest, no to contest the flag. You have I'm a saying you're inserting, right to do it. You are inserting a racial angle where none necessarily exists, and it's irresponsible. If, and CNN if is doing I'm it as well. If I'm inserting it, then I'm inserting it because it's obvious to any eyes that aren't rose-colored. So it's that's, just you know, a that's part. your opinion, the but it's like a news organization. But hold on, you well, can see this. I don't work this. for CNN, so I can't but defend do you think them. But I someone, think that what was okay. said on this issue was true. Do you think someone who gets up as a reporter and claims to be a conveyor of the news ought to be speculating with no evidence about the opinions or attitudes or deepest beliefs of a figure in the news? Do you think we should just make up something and say this is what he meant when we don't know that? Well, here's why the thing. would you do that when you just said that Spike Lee was a conspiracy because nut? Because he told me a conspiracy what he, nut what he theory said to, my to face. you was what he believed to be true, and you, as a journalist, commented on it and gave your own opinion about what no, he said. No, it's not my opinion. It's so a factual statement. The levies were not. Isn't up. really a factual assertion. Actually, it is. The okay. levies were not. We know conclusively. And that is just a derogatory statement. Because that's an outrageous thing to say. And the African-American run city of New Orleans determined that was untrue. It's a lie. So he shouldn't say it because it scares the hell out of people. That's all I'm saying. Who got scared? I did. To think okay. my government well, would blow up a levy. Okay, that's And if you're grotesque. feeling any amount of fear, then it may be like a smidge close to what an African-American right. male is okay. feeling just well, maybe it's driving people, down the block or Maybe it's like people like that are making it worse. That's my point. They're making right. it worse. Monique, thank you. Thank you for having me. Lawrence Jones is a host at The Blaze TV, and he joins us now. So, Lawrence, as I just said, I, I, I'm not against police or the abuse of power, which I think is real, not just in the police, but anyone who has power tends yeah. to abuse it. And I, I think we should talk about that. Yeah. What I'm against is people who claim to be journalists making claims they can't back up for the sake of scaring the hell out of their viewers so they'll keep watching. And that's what I see happening on CNN. Yeah, Tucker, it's one thing to talk about, and thanks for having me, it's one thing to talk about police brutality and talk about both issues that I'm passionate about and bringing the community together. But it's another thing to accuse the president of having racist comments. And I think this is something that the left is doing to push their name. They know that when they do that, it rouses people's emotions. Uh, if you know anything about Donald Trump, he has no respect of a person. I mean, whether you're a woman, Cricket Hillary, uh, little Marco, uh, he goes after people. He just does. And no matter what race, male or female, that's just his style. It's one thing to say you disagree with his style, but to suggest that he's racist, uh, homophobic, or whatever uh, label they want to put on it, I think it's just being intellectually dishonest. Well, I think it is, too. And I don't even think it's about Trump. I may be the only person in America who's not even that deeply. I'm deeply interested in people saying what they think is true without being shouted down by name callers. And I think that if the president or any other figure is not allowed to give what is a complete within bounds view, don't disrespect the flag. That's not a crazy thing to say. If you can't say that without being called a racist, then I don't think I can either. And I want to jealously guard my right to say what I think is true. Do you see what I mean? I totally agree. But for it's one thing to have a conversation of you disagreeing with the president's comments, which I thought the president, he, he he shared the sentiment uh, uh, you know, of many Americans because a lot of people don't like the flag being disrespected. That's totally reasonable. Uh, but I did disagree with the president getting involved in a private business yeah, and okay, telling them what fine. to do. That's one argument. But to suggest that it was based on race uh, that the president came to this conclusion, as I said, is intellectually dishonest. But the problem is, is that when people make those outrageous claims debate, and I would encourage people that are on the right that typically go with the left on this issue that it, it happens to every Republican, no matter if it was Donald Trump or Marco Rubio or Ted Cruz. Uh, this is what they do to all Republicans, all conservatives, until you're faced with somebody that looks like me and you can't go around on TV calling me a racist black man. But if the, 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 the long-term consequences of it are profound, and if you look at the polling, people increasingly distrust each other, they hate each other, they fear each other. 
And there are a lot of reasons for it, but this kind of news coverage is one of the reasons. If you're telling people constantly, you are hated, there's a conspiracy against you, you're never going to get a fair shake, the people in power want to kill you without any evidence. By the way, if there's ever any evidence that the president or anyone else has attitudes like that, I'll be the first to denounce them, and I mean that. Oh, me but too. if there's you no know, evidence, you shouldn't say it, right? Right, and I'm a crazy libertarian, so anytime the government gets out of line, I'm quick to address that. But again, Tucker, um, if the media truly is interested in having a national conversation, then they would be more responsible with their reporting because this doesn't help the national conversation. As a matter of fact, Tucker, this keeps people from the table having spirited conversations. I understand people getting angry and upset. People get mad at what I say. But at the end of the day, you can't call every time someone says something that you dislike racist. It's just down the conversation. Yeah. I don't think we're dealing with people who want to have a conversation. Well, they're not because rational. And, and, and the thing is, they need to be held responsible for it. People shouldn't be supporting these organizations if they continue to just spew out hate. They're just as bad as the people that they accuse of being racist. I'm sorry. I want to say Monique is still sitting here next to me, and she's she's responding in, in, in a way that suggests I want to put her back on TV to respond Go ahead. to you. Monique, I, I don't think you're sold. No, I don't think it's convincing at all because every just heard is the line we hear over and over again in order to not have a voice and a say so, when racism right. really is an issue. So, Monique, the, does the, the president whistle, not att attack not all groups of people? Just answer momento. that simple question. Un momento. The dog whistle has turned into a megaphone. That's a, a nice talking point, but you're not answering the question, Monique. The bulliest of the bulliest pulpits in the world. Nice talking world. point, Monique. Right. And when, it, it I know you're chiming point. in, but I mean, when it's, it's the not, president you know, over the, says things that to are all reminiscent groups of, of the. You you know what? The fact that he is an equal opportunity insulter doesn't mean that he doesn't insult people of color along color lines no, or that he doesn't he insult insult. everyone. And that does not it's excuse him. It's not a crime him. to be insulted. It's not racist is, to be is, insulted. It is Can not I ask you a question that I've been that thinking this whole time? Do you everyone. feel, since you're on television, a lot of people are watching you, any responsibility at all to be responsible and fact-based in your comments? Yes. Do you have any sense of what you're saying what effect that has on how people feel about each other? You don't seem to care. I have a concern that I speak truth and that I speak facts. If the facts that that's I not, speak, that's not that's an evidence at all. if the facts that I speak and the analysis, which is opinion, and I'm sure right. everybody who's on to not that, if my factual analysis is based on truth truth, then the fact that it may concern you, Tucker, or it may scare you, or it may upset you you really is necessary because then what I'm but sharing you don't with have you facts, actually. is what and that's you know, when and that's we the trouble if we were debating the tax code I would say look we you know we differ I think your economics are wrong right. we're talking about something that is based on the America's original sin and that is an open wound to this day. Yes. And we and should I think talk on about the basis it. of no facts, but you were making it but worse. But what was that original sin? The original sin well, wasn't, yes, but it wasn't the bounds of slavery physically. It was the notion that okay. one race being whites is superior yeah, to it. another. And that's what we're still seeing. We're seeing the once But you have no evidence for that. Into, how can and you say that there's no evidence for it when people are dying? Dying in the streets yeah. simply because you can talk of about that color. without calling right. everybody that racism. Going to, okay, That's racism. I'm sorry, unfortunately, we're out of time. <laughs> okay. Thanks for enjoying Tucker. this, Monique. Thank you, Lawrence. Thank, thank you, you again. We just heard CNN anchor Chris Cuomo his views on things. Let's just say you can't get enough of Chris Cuomo. You want to hear more Chris Cuomo, but you don't want to have to watch CNN to get it. You're in luck. We have more later in the show. Greatest hits from Chris Cuomo. Trust me, worth it. And violence from Antifa becoming routine, and now a libertarian at NYU, a librarian rather, far from libertarian at NYU, says violence is necessary for the good of the country. Alan Dershowitz of Harvard here to weigh in on that next. Political fanaticism on campus keeps getting more intense, but at the same time also more routine. A New York University librarian, April Hathcock, says that violence by Antifa isn't simply indefensible, but necessary. Quote, fighting oppression is messy, Hathcock wrote in a recent essay, and that's okay. It's still vitally worth doing. 
So far, there are no signs that Hathcock's job is in danger. Alan Dershowitz is the author of Trumped Up. He's also a retired Harvard Law School professor who has frequently spoken on various campuses, including last night at Columbia University in New York. And he joins us tonight. Professor, thanks for coming on. Thank you. So uh, you are a First Amendment absolutist, self-described, and I think your career attests to that. Where's the line? Is it okay from the perspective of a school administration to have an employee advocate political violence? Well, I think employees are different than students uh, because they're supposed to be role models. Students are supposed to listen to them. NYU is a private university, and I think the president would be well within his rights to fire a professor who advocates violence, particularly to students, because it's students who are joining Antifa. It's growing by leaps and bounds, and he's justifying not only violence, but violence to suppress free speech and academic freedom. I guess the implication of what he's saying is if a teacher gets up in class and pronounces a view that he regards as sexist, it would be okay for the students to get up and beat up the teacher. Uh, right. Or like the student uh, the other day in New York, in the Bronx, pull out a knife and kill a fellow student who is expressing a contrary view. Where does it end if one side can use violence to stop oppression? Oppression is in the eye of the beholder. What does the other side do? In that, is a, that is a wise point that is often overlooked by the advocates of squelching speech. So you've said recently that you are considering suing Cal Berkeley, University of California at Berkeley, um, for suppressing free speech. Explain your case. Well, I was invited by a group of students to speak at Berkeley about Israel, and I generally am supportive of Israel in the two states. The Berkeley administration has said that they won't allow me to speak because I didn't give them eight weeks advance notice, but there's an exception to the eight-week rule. If you're in Invited by to give an eight-week notice. Now, right. who's invited by departments? Radicals, liberals, people of the left, and anti-Israel speakers. Speakers like me, a moderate liberal who supports, generally don't get invited by departments. So what we've done now is asked a number of departments to invite us. If no department invites us, having invited people on on the other side, we will sue them, arguing that the eight-week rule is a cover for content-based discrimination against moderates, liberals, conservatives, and supporters of Israel. What do you think you'll find when they produce the schedule and list of speakers they've invited to campus? Well, I have no doubt that anti-Israel speakers are invited by departments all the time, all over the United States. and. Often, when an anti-Israel speaker has been invited and groups want to have me come to present the other side, the school won't invite me. The departments won't invite me. That happened at a number of universities. And we're testing Berkeley at this point to see if it happens there. Look, this is not being done for test. I'm going to California to visit my members of my family. And I was invited to speak at the school. And I wanted to present to the students the liberal case for uh, Israel. And if Berkeley won't let me do it, it's a public I have a legal recourse, which I intend to take. I hope Berkeley will allow me to speak. Either their department will invite me or the school will change the rule, because the rule has all kind of potential for misuse. It says you need to give eight weeks if you're a high-profile person. What does that mean? Uh, if the Good president question. of the United States said, I want to speak at Berkeley, they would make him wait eight weeks? What if some liberal activist, famous actor or actress decided to speak? You think they would really make them wait eight weeks? I think it's much too vague a term to satisfy the requirements of the First Amendment for a public university. Yeah, Noam Chomsky is not waiting eight weeks to no. attack Israel on the campus of Berkeley. Is there any precedent for a suit like yours? I've never heard of a precedent for the eight-week rule, so there's no precedent for my suit, but I think it's a very strong suit. I think Berkeley will realize it's a strong suit, and I think in the end they will allow me to speak. But if they don't, they have to comply with the rule of law, including the First Amendment. You're a brave man. Alan Dershowitz, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank you. Bizarre new revelations tonight in the case of that alleged NSA leaker, Reality Winner. Among other things, she hated Fox News so much, she filed a formal complaint against the television set. That and more details just ahead. Judge Roy Moore won the Alabama Republican.
Republican Senate primary earlier this week, and he won it easily. He beat incumbent Luther Strange by almost 10 points. Now, Moore won despite unrelentingly hostile press coverage, not to mention a bumpy political history. Moore has been removed twice from the Alabama Supreme Court by judicial discipline panels. People in that state's richest zip codes consider him a buffoon and maybe dangerous. Luther Strange and his allies, by contrast, had almost universal support from Republican leaders in the state and across the country, many of whom he considers friends. Luther Strange is a decent person. Nobody denies that. By some calculations, he outspent Roy Moore by seven to one. And most significant of all, Luther Strange had the enthusiastic endorsement of Donald Trump, who remains immensely popular in the state of Alabama, and yet he lost anyway. It was remarkable. What are the lessons here, exactly? Well, first, it's getting harder to call the Trump phenomenon a cult of personality. Now, that may come as news to the press corps and himself, both of whom assume it's all about Trump's personal appeal, shooting someone on Fifth Avenue and all that. But it turns out that's not really true. If it were true, Luther Strange would be a senator right now, and the latest health care bill would be law. Trump supported both of those. His voters did not. It's now pretty clear the Trump movement is not primarily about Donald Trump. The president is popular and powerful when he's taking on the establishment of both parties, but he's diminished when he's aligned with them. The message is bigger than the man. So what's the message? Well, the same as it always was. Our elites have failed. That message resonates because it's true. For decades, the country has watched as the leaders of both parties sell them out, putting the interests of multinational corporations, D.C. lobbyists, even foreign countries ahead of the concerns of Americans. They're enraged by this, not surprisingly, and they'll consider backing almost anybody who fights back against it. That's why Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders and Roy Moore all did far better than predicted. Now, when you look closely, the three don't seem to have much in common at all. But take a few steps back. Their messages are essentially the same. The people in charge don't care about you. Try something else. It's all pretty obvious when you think about it, though for some reason virtually nobody in Washington ever seems to figure it out. They are shocked and appalled every time it happens. They wonder, what's wrong with voters? They never seem to consider what's wrong with themselves. Well, do you remember Reality Winner? She the NSA employee arrested earlier this year for leaking classified secrets. Now, according to newly filed court documents, her behavior was not just odd, but bizarre. Fox's Peter Ducey has been on this story all day, and he joins us with details. What is this? So, Tucker, the final straw for this NSA translator named Reality Winner that made her stuff classified material into her pantyhose and then head for the door was that the NSA in, had intel in an NSA database that had classified reporting about Russian election interference that the public had not been briefed on, and she thought that they should know because she figured that sources and methods had already been compromised anyway. But shortly after sneaking the material in her pantyhose past guards at the NSA's out post at Fort Gordon Military Reservation in Georgia and mailing it to the news outlet The Intercept. The FBI followed digital footprints to her front door and that is when she said part of her problem with the NSA was Fox News on TV. Page 58 of the FBI interview transcript. She says this, I guess it's just been hard at work because and old formal complaints about them having Fox News on, you know, uh, just at least for God's sake put Al Jazeera on or a slideshow with people's pets. I've tried everything to get that changed. <laughs> Reality Winner also left a lot of clues on Facebook and chats with her sister and one of them, the suspected leaker, says this, quote, look, I only say I hate America like three times a day. I'm no radical. It's mostly just about Americans' obsession with air conditioning. Back, but you don't actually hate America, right? And Reality said, I mean, yeah, I do. It's literally the worst thing to happen on the planet. We invented capitalism, the downfall of the environment. Else that is extraordinary in these documents that are interviewing her, the FBI at her house, and they say, okay, anything else classified on your desk back at the NSA that we need to know about? And she said, I have a picture of Anderson Cooper that's signed, but the autograph is not real. And they say, but no classified information? And she said, oh, no. Just just open the pantyhose. Picture of Anderson Cooper with an ersatz autograph. Peter, that was that was fantastic. Thanks, Tucker. I'm really glad you came tonight. Thank, Thank you. you.
Well, up next, Facebook, one of the most powerful companies in the history of the world. Is it evil? Up next, we'll discuss Facebook's drive to censor fake news while collaborating with authoritarian foreign governments and squelching content to their benefit in exchange for profit. Plus, Fox correspondent Rich Edson squares off against a former Obama administration spokeswoman in this week's final exam. Ooh, it's a close one, too. Stay tuned. CNN's Chris Cuomo is an awfully busy man. Some days he's doing with America's racial divide, doing a pretty good job on that. Others, he's warning regular Americans it's illegal to read leaked emails embarrassing Hillary Clinton. But even with that packed schedule, he still still takes time to post videos like this on Facebook, and we're glad he does. First, the good news. Rose is back. Show yourself, Rose. Yay! Rose just got married. We're all very happy. All right, now back to the serious stuff. Um, I'm keeping this up here. The hashtag stand firm. Please use it. Why? Fight injustice, reinforce morality. Okay, that's what the firm part stands for. It applies to everything. Look at Puerto Rico. There are problems there with the recovery. Not the storm, that's obvious. By now, you better know that because the coverage has been complete. You should see it, you should understand it, you should connect to it. Why aren't they getting more help to the places that need it faster? We have to push for accountability. We know that there's some intention there. We know the president was slow to it, but we have to get after it. This also applies to this health care mess. They don't have the votes. The president shouldn't say that they do. That's not optimism, it's being deceptive. You need truth, you need accuracy. And lastly, on taxes. You need details because what came out helps the haves, not the have-nots. Have a great day. Great job. Well, this video raises a lot of questions, some of them theological. What exactly is Chris Cuomo talking about? What office is he running for? Do Chris Cuomo and the rest of us exist in the true reality or in a strange cartoonist simulated universe? Where in the world did this come from? And in a world where Chris Cuomo has a TV show, what has meaning? What is virtue? Does God exist? These are questions that arise when we watch these videos. We're going to try to find answers, updates later in the week. Well, 15 years ago, Facebook didn't even exist. Today, it's one of the world's most, the biggest news company in history. As a result, it's important to ask what Facebook is doing with all the information they gather and with all the power they wield. Can they be trusted? Scott Cleland wrote a book about this, about big tech companies, Search and Destroy. You can't trust Google Inc. He joins us tonight. You're one of the few who's really thought deeply about this. And the core question right now about Facebook is can we trust Mark Zuckerberg and his staff not to censor news? What you need to look at is Facebook is a series of conflicts. It's a hot mess of, of conflicts. So first of all, it's an unaccountable mon a monopoly that's in the influence. It's an autocracy that's pretending to be a democracy. You then have this black box technology that tells everybody else has to be completely transparent. You have a media company who actually will live, live broadcast murder, torture, and rape with no editorial um, uh, on it at all. Then you have a self-appointed regulator of free speech that claims to be neutral. And then you also have a self-appointed political organizer and a, with a mission that's very political saying, oh, I'm not political, you can, you can trust me. Now, it's okay, whatever their politics are, but when you try and say you're not political, their new, new mission, which Mark Zuckerberg um, gave us just uh, in June, give people the power to build community and bring the world closer together. Now, anybody that has a sense about politics knows the word is a po it, politics is, is politics. Well, of course it is. So um, Facebook clearly has a political agenda. They're clearly hostile to certain worldviews. And it seems like they have a history of squelching certain parts of the news in order to please foreign governments. And, and that's a problem. You know, when you're an autocracy, a, a technological autocracy, half of the countries or more, depending on how you judge it, are autocracies. So they have despots that run them. And um, when you have a company that's two billion users and your value, they're the force value, most valuable company in the world, their value comes on how, how many users they have and how much right. they're used. And so if a company, country says, hey, country, you do this, they comply. Meanwhile, they're saying, we're neutral and, um, but they and we're engage not political. in censorship on behalf of authoritarian government. Yes, because they, 
They, that's the deal they've made, is they know that they're valuable because many people use them. So they them. suck up to dictators in order to make money, but we have to trust them as the largest news organization in history not to censor our news to influence us with propaganda. Why would we trust them to do that? Well, you know, like anything, you need to take anything with a grain of, uh, you know, with a grain of salt. The reason you, you shouldn't trust them here is um, on fake news and fake ads, you know, how, you say, how could that happen? Well. They're the most profitable ads because somebody designed them to be viral, meaning that they were like clickbait or you know just something that people can't resist, and that's what um, um, and that's algorithmically detectable. Because right. if you see somebody who's doing viral stuff and it's of a certain type, it, it, an algorithm can pig, figure it out because it's a pattern. And so what is um, you know really a, uh, I think a, um, a problem here is is that they're like an arms merchant in war where they make their their most money when people are politically divided and they make less if people aren't passionate and I, at peace. It sounds ominous that they have more power than any information company has ever had. Scott, thank yes. you for that and thank for you. all the work you've done on it. Final exam is next. Which of these two DC news aficionados has actually been paying attention to the news this week? Only one can win. We'll be right back.